Today's reading from the Acts of the Apostles is part of a longer passage describing what sometimes has been called the Council of Jerusalem. The issue with which it had to deal was introduced in yesterday's reading. A number of Jewish Christians from Jerusalem had come down to Antioch and were finding fault with Paul and Barnabas for not having required Gentile converts to embrace the Mosaic law as part of their becoming Christians. What these people were saying was that unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Although the two sides argued the issue at some length, no consensus was reached. The decision was then taken to send Paul, Barnabas, and a few others to Jerusalem to discuss the matter with the original apostles and with the elders who by this time were exercising a leading role in the Jerusalem church. There was a strong sense in Antioch that the church in Jerusalem as the mother church had to be in accord with any decision that they might take about such a serious matter. Today's reading underlines the difficulty of the question when it tells us that there was considerable debate about it. Finally, Peter and James speak. Peter recalls his own experience with the Roman centurion Cornelius and how he accepted the gospel. Clearly, Peter argues, God's grace is being offered to the Gentiles and they are responding to it. That being the case, he adds, we should not put any extra burden on them. The fundamental reason Peter gives is one that Paul will use in a number of his letters. Salvation comes not from the law, but from grace. That is, from the free gift of God in Christ. One of the most striking things about this debate is that it had to take place at all. For us, it seems all but self-evident that salvation from God in Jesus is meant for all peoples. At the same time, we take for granted that the universality of the gospel implies that it will not require non-Jewish believers to embrace the Mosaic law. All this was much less evident in the early church. Jesus himself, after all, was a Jew as were all the first disciples, including the apostles. They thought of Jesus initially as the Messiah of Israel, the one who fulfilled the promises made through the prophets. The gospel was originally preached to Jews. The success of the outreach to the Gentiles came as a surprise. It inevitably raised the question dealt with at the meeting in Jerusalem. Given the importance of this issue, it's also striking that Jesus did not resolve it ahead of time. It was clearly something with enormous ramifications for the subsequent development of the church. In spite of that, he left it to them to deal with. And so the church of Jerusalem and its leaders met with Paul and the others and debated what to do. Finally, Peter and James and the elders came to a decision. In the letter they sent to the church at Antioch, they introduced their decision with the phrase, it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. They believed that the spirit of the risen Christ was with them in the decision that they made. Even with this decision, however, the issue did not go away. We hear repeatedly in Paul's letters of conflict in regard to it. Some believers refuse to accept that Gentiles could be serious Christians without also following the Mosaic law. The single most important church event in my lifetime, and one that deeply influenced my understanding and practice of our religion, was the Second Vatican Council. I was ordained just before the council in 1962. 
Between 1963 and 1965, while the council was underway, I was a student in Rome and was able to share to some degree in the excitement of what was taking place. Subsequently, in Germany, I was privileged to work with theologians who had been active and influential at the council. Vatican II attempted to renew the church, both in its inner life and in its relation to those outside of it, in relation to other Christians, to Jews, and to members of other religious traditions, as well as to the modern world. On a score of issues, it marked a significant moment of renewal in the life of the church. It is no surprise that the implementation of the council was not easy or uniformly successful. This was the result not only of the range and complexity of the issues dealt with, but also of the changes that were taking place in the world at large. Since the 1960s, our world has become more secular and more pluralistic. The atmosphere within which we all live tends to make us focus on ourselves and on the amassing of money and of consumer goods. Although new questions have arisen and older ones continue to be debated, Vatican II stands as an extraordinary moment in the recent history of the Church. It represents for us the kind of decisive leadership that the so-called Council of Jerusalem was able to offer to the early Church. Vatican II's vision represents a shining light that continues to point the way for us as we struggle to live up to our commitments in a changed and changing world. I, for one, am enormously grateful that the Council took place when it did and that it was able to achieve so much. God's spirit was as clearly with it as it was with the apostles in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. Let us now in faith and trust present before God our needs. For all of us that our sharing in this Eucharist will deepen our sense of the spirit's presence in the church, let us pray to the Lord. For peace and justice throughout the world, and especially in the Middle East, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for families, especially for single-parent families and for families undergoing challenges at this time, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the elderly and the chronically ill, that those who can will reach out to them in their need, let us pray to the Lord. For our deceased relatives and friends, and for all those who have died this past night, that they will be brought to eternal life in God, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Gracious God, we ask you to hear and grant these prayers as well as the more personal ones that each one of us has in his or her own heart. All this we pray through Christ our Lord. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Amen. 